Hello, everyone. A few weeks have went by. A lot of things have happened. Had a chance to be paying attention. Keep your eyes open. You saw a lot of stuff. You had a lot to think about. Let's get right to work. <clears throat> I thought this was an interesting article on the basis of CERN opening a doorway. We can see in somewhere see what's behind the veil let something in send something through unlock the stargate unlock the gate of hell unlock something according to this we're going to do some more gate breaking next week and they're hoping to connect with a parallel universe. It's going to be fired up to the highest level ever. They're going to try to break down the gate. Or if they can't break it completely, it appears they want to make a tiny hole. Kind of like digging under the gate. Digging under the fence. If they are successful, a completely new universe will be revealed, rewriting the physics books and the philosophy books. Possible that gravity from our own universe could leak into this parallel universe. Geneva remains intact and comfortably outside the event horizon. They said that because they claim this is to sh in going to be sure to inflame alarmist critics, many of who warn that this could harm or spell the end of our universe with the creating a black hole of its own. And then they go on to talk about how it has been successful in finding the Higgs boson, the quote, God particle, unquote, which they claim is a key building block of the universe in the old Big Bang. You know, if you think about the Big Bang and their argument for the Big Bang, they say there was nothing until the Big Bang. Well, nothing means nothing, doesn't it? So where would the elements have come from to combine and cause the Big Bang if there was nothing, as they claim? I don't think they've ever explained that. Anyway, Mayor Fizal was one of the three teams strong of physicists says just as many parallel sheets of paper, which are two-dimensional objects in the breadth and length, can exist in a third dimension, which is height. Parallel universes can also exist in higher dimensions. And they are predicting that gravity can leak into the extra dimensions, and if it does, then miniature black holes can be produced. When people think of a multiverse, they think of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics where every possibility is actualized. This cannot be tested, and so it is philosophy and not science, and this is not what we mean by parallel universes. What we mean is real universes and extra dimensions. What have we said before? Angels are interdimensional beings. You hear the quote alien unquote argument that they are interdimensional beings? If you live in Kansas and someone comes to visit you from Oklahoma, they have crossed your border, have they not? And they have come into where you live. Such is the nature of 
fallen angels, and demons. They don't live here. They cross over to get here through another dimension. They haven't all been able to flood over here yet because they're being held out by God's holy angels. We're being protected. But there comes a time when the protection is removed. And I believe the farther away we turn from God, the quicker the protection gets removed and the quicker prophecies fulfill. Back to the article. Gravity can flow out of our universe into the extra dimension such that the model can be tested by the detection of many black holes. We've calculated the energy at which we expect to detect these many black holes in gravity's rainbow, which is a new theory. If we do detect these holes at this energy, then they're going to know that Gravity's rainbow and extra dimensions are correct. That's what they believe. Now this energy is measured in tera electron volts, so think about it. A TeV is one trillion electron volts. Now I have heard that they want to get this thing up to 17. <clears throat> so we would be talking 17 trillion electron volts. Let that sink in. There is no machine on this planet that we know of, and I don't believe that there is, that has that much energy to it. And we're going to play this little video. I'm not sure what it's going to actually be. I have not watched it, so you and I will see a little bit of it. If it's not worth it, I'll stop it. Insignificant though this bottle of compressed hydrogen gas looks, it marks the beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. Their journey to eventually take part in ultra-high energy collisions, similar to those following the Big Bang, can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Linux 2 to be likened to the lumbering first stage of a huge rocket. By the time this packet of protons leaves Linux 2, it will be travelling at one-third the speed of light. It's about to enter the booster, stage 2 of the rocket, if you will. In order to maximise the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided up into four, one for each of the booster's rings. Straight acceleration is now impractical, and the booster is circular, 157 meters in circumference. In order to accelerate the packets, they are repeatedly circulated, and the electric field is now pulsed in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles to their direction of motion, and so powerful electromagnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then flung on into the proton synchrotron, by analogy stage 3 of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 meters in circumference, and they circulate for 1.2 seconds, reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. 
It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increased velocity as they're already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster, so they get heavier. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or GeV. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now channeled into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring of 7 kilometers in circumference, designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 GeV. Soon, the packets of protons will be energized sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps, and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometers. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC, containing proton beams traveling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronize incoming packets with those already circulating, one vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise, and the other the protons which will circulate anti-clockwise. The counter-rotating beams cross over in the four detector caverns, where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons, and it's the debris from these collisions that is trapped in the detectors. For half an hour, the SPS injects protons. Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light that it goes round the 27 kilometer ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electron volts, and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 amps must flow through its electromagnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space, so that its magnets become supercase, so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide in the detectors. A steering magnet finally brings them onto a collision course. The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volts and reproduces, reproduces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Particle tracks from these collisions will be analysed by computers connected to the detectors and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved, what governs its behaviour today and where it's going in the future. Well, there it is. That's their, another one of their little videos. Now, <clears throat> another thing that's been mentioned is possibly could they use this for time travel? Well, I don't actually think they can travel in time. I've given this idea a lot of thought. When you read about King Solomon, you read about his ability to call up demons and bind them where he cannot be harmed and command them to do work 
tasks, mainly from what I've read, um, building tasks of, of large structures and heavy items to lift and move and place. But it was written from the readings that I made that he would ask their name and they would tell him. They would appear in their true form, which seemed creaturely, beastly, half man, half creature stuff sometimes. And then he would uh, ask them to appear to him as a man, so he didn't have to look at them in their true form, apparently. And they would, so they have the ability through what is written in those writings to appear as a man, a human man. Anyway, some had the ability to tell the past, answer questions of the ancient past, and of the future. Now, how could they know the future if it had not even happened? Could they possibly see the future? And my thought on that is no. Well, I think as far as seeing the future, going into the future, it is like all the variables combined of the predictability of the thoughts the actions of the human that can be all put together just like a supercomputer brain would do and reason out within 99.9999 to the nth predictability of what the future will be. But there's always that minuscule chance that something changes and makes that predictability not happen. Now I think that's what these demons were able to do based on human activity, what they had done, what is the likelihood of what they will do. When you ask them a question about the future, they were able to base their answer on the predictability and the odds of what would be versus what wouldn't be. So no, I don't think that they can actually send a person through a portal into another time, like the year 3000 or something. I believe they could get information from this giant thing and from these demons that are on the other side of it, just like Solomon did information, information leading to higher technology, all sorts of things. And in their warped and twisted minds, <clears throat> they may have built this thing and think this will hold them back. If, if this may be their little way of thinking they can bind them like Solomon and use them for whatever they want. without them getting loose. Bring them over, get what you need, keep them locked up. But I got a bad feeling that ain't really their goal. They worship Lucifer, the devil. These are his minions in league with him. They're all scum. They were good at one time. They gave their goodness up. Now they're no good anymore. They have only evil coming from them. Anything that they would give mankind that mankind would think would be good, it would serve their interest to ultimately destroy, enslave, 
and take the soul of every one of mankind into the depth of hell. So I think their main goal is to bring them over and not keep them locked up. And I think that's part of the the end times and the coming of Antichrist. I think it's part of it. We also witnessed what I believe is maybe not, but possibly so, the final piece of the New World Order placement. You saw the meeting, or heard of the meeting, at the United Nations, in which they set sweeping new goals. It's a 15 year plan. It's a 2030 plan. These are called Sustainable Development Goals. And they have been adopted by the 193 UN member states. Francis was also there when he made his speech. It is 17 broad goals and 169 specific targets. They are going to cost the world three and a half trillion to five trillion a year per year. That's fifty two and a half trillion to seventy five trillion. That's a lot of money they're going to be stealing, isn't it? Saying it's used for this. But you can bet your bottom dollar it'll be used for something else. They may Put a little window dressing up front, make it look like they're doing something, so everybody claps their hands and sings kumbaya, rah, rah, rah. But the majority of it will be probably feeding the CERN so they can have their demon buddies coming over and keep that thing operational and keep that gate open. At this article here, the 169 targets have not been fully outlined in terms of how this success would be measured. Another article, they have adopted the goals, like I said. 17 sustainable goals. 15 years. And they are going to give it a big global push to win the public. Your mind. There's a war on for your mind and what you think about what they're doing. They're going to make it just as creamy and good sounding as they can so they get as many of you on board and brainwashed as possible. That way you already got your foot in the door for the Antichrist New World Order system. You're going to be a player if they can sway you into it. Francis called the adoption an important sign of hope. So he's a player in it. He says the world leaders must follow through with a will which is effective practical con and constant concrete steps and immediate measures to protect the environment and end social and economic exclusion. Here. Supporters say the SDGs go much further by addressing root causes of issues such as poverty and looking at means as well as ends. They are intended to be universal, not just for the developing world. They are for the entire world and every person on it. Let that sink in, folks. 
the whole entire world will be under this. That is an antichrist system in your face. This last September, adopted. A to-do list for the people in the planet in a blueprint for success, said Monkey Moon. We have a transformative set of global goals agreed by all countries and apply to every nation. Get that through to you. Global, all, every. He causes everyone to receive the mark. And if you don't take it, you will die. He will kill you. He will have his minions kill you. That is the coming of the mark. In whatever form that, that actually takes. The mark of the beast is global all and every. So these are rules and governance that go along with it. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> now this is a very long article here. And this this goes all into it. This is the preamble. And we'll come all the way down here and we'll get to the seventeen goals. Now just because something sounds good on the outside, seems like a good idea, I don't mean you should be for it. Because the old adage generally holds true. If it sounds too good to be true, more not times than not, it is too good to be true. They're going to end all the poverty in all its forms everywhere. How many times have we heard that? You're going to end hunger. How many times have we heard that? They're, how, they're going to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being. Well, how do you ensure a healthy life? If somebody wants to eat 15 bags of Doritos a day, or 10 quarter pounders with cheese a day, you're going to have to not allow that, wouldn't you? That wouldn't be a healthy life, would it? Anyway, they're going to ensure healthy lives. They're going to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education for what they want you to be educated with and how they want you to think. Lifelong learning opportunities for all. Achieve gender equality. Boy, they're gonna they're really going after you women out there. With that don't let them brainwash you with this. You're gonna empower all the women and girls. Ensure the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation. Ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. But you can't have any of the free energy. You get it. You can't have what we know and where he is. Promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Full. Full employment. But doesn't Obama say that by the percentages 
which were hovering supposedly according to those rig numbers at 5%, that would be classified as full employment. But yet there's 90 some odd million people with no job. But yet that's full employment, huh? And who determines what is decent work for all? Build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation, reduce inequality within and among countries. Inequality. Make sure you think about these things. Make cities and human settlements. Inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Take urgent action. Urgent. It is urgent to combat climate change and its impacts. Yeah. It's amazing to me how many people they have actually already brainwashed about this. Especially the youth of today. I'm sorry you young ones out there. It's all you've ever known. You never knew what the climate was like before you were even born. You never knew what the sky looked like before you were born. But you don't know the difference between then and now. You believe what you're told. You don't ask enough questions and you don't think. They're capturing your minds, taking them where they want them to be, and you're not even realizing it. Conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems. Sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, desertification. Halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. Promote the peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provoke, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. And then it goes down with each goal. It's got subsets and different things it says in there about these goals. Like I said, it's a lot of words here to go over. Trade. Promote a universal world, the whole world, every nation. Rules based, open, non discriminatory, and equitable multilateral trading sister system under the World Trade Organization, including through the conclusion of negotiations under its Doha development agenda. We reaffirm our strong commitment to the full implementation of this new agenda. Strong commitment. They're going to get it. They got everything they wanted so far. They have got their new world order. We got it, folks. It's not coming. It's already here. You're in it. Sorry. The B system is here. And this, this preamble goes on to say 
these golden targets will stimulate action in the next 15 years for humanity and the planet. The people in the world they live in. Excuse me. Now, also at the United Nations, when the Pope was there and the UN was doing their thing, adopting these new measures, we also saw um, the Palestinian flag raised for the first time at the UN headquarters in New York. It was attended by a boss. He is saying the question of Palestinian statehood is unresolved and it's un, you know unconscionable. Now, if you look it up, I suggest the easiest thing for you to do would be just to go to Wikipedia, or you can use any source you prefer and trust, and just look up Palestine. You're going to find that there never actually was anything called Palestine. Even thousands of years ago, there was something else, Palestia, I think that was the name of it, but it's not Palestine. Palestine is a name possibly derived from that. And there were a people back then of that. And then you're going to go through your reading, and, and you're going to come upon some talk about Philistines, and then whenever you go and search out and start reading and researching who who actually were Philistines, you're going to end up finding out that more times than not, they were biblically described as enemies of the Israelites. Okay, you get it? They're enemies all the way back then, before Christ. More times than not, they're enemies. There was a couple times, you know, that they made an agreement, had some peace and stuff, but more times than not, they were enemies. And it also goes down and breaks down a definition of uh, uh, Philistines as invaders. When you when you invade somewhere, you're you're coming into a place that's not yours and invading. So that's my argument. There is that this is thousands of years old. The argument has been going, and they've been doing the same thing back and forth, fighting. They've been invading and fighting and taking over and then getting beat back. In our modern times, they've been beaten back and they haven't been able to invade and take it again. So instead of just out and out warfare like before, today they would be crushed if they tried it. So they have to use other methods, public opinion, public pressure. And I believe even our Pope has also made some statements leading one to, to believe that he you know, might think that the two-state solution is the key answer to peace over there. The article goes on to say, we expect and call on the authority and leader to act responsibility to accede to the pro proposal of Israel and enter into direct negotiations with Israel without preconditions. They call the raising of the Palestinian flag the most emotional and proud day. Now, 
I can't be clear enough. I'd be hard pressed to believe that the Israelis will agree to a two state to split that land. But I firmly believe if they do, oh boy, is there going to be some repercussions out of that. God doesn't want that land split. If they want to come and if they want to come and live there, fine. Move on over there and live. But if they want to take all that land for themselves and rename it Palestine, God is not going to go for that. So whomever joins in pressing for a two-state solution, if it's ever done, whoever is involved, even in the smallest way, of being involved with, with land for peace and a two-state solution, all those countries will be dealt with by the Most High in very harsh ways. He will split their land. No, I can't find it. <laughs> well, something disappeared here. I have to bring up another browser and see if I can find that. There it is. <clears throat> Now, when Francis was at St. Patrick's, the man continually blows my mind. When I read what he says, everything seems normal and popely and, and, and reason, fairly reasonable. Some, most, you know, I got to give the benefit of the doubt, most of the time. But there seems to be always a portion of it where there'll be a paragraph that comes out in what he's saying that just looks like it doesn't belong in what he's already been saying. And then you, you get the, the mind blown, the brain shock. So when you go over this whole thing that he said, I am never... I've tried and tried and tried, but I am not able to place myself in the same meaning of whatever actually he's meaning when I get to this, this paragraph. We can get caught up measuring the value of our apostolic works by the standards of efficiency, good management, and outward success which governs the business world. Not at these things that are unimportant. We've been entrusted with a great responsibility, and God's people rightly expect accountability from us. But the true worth of our apostolate is measured by the value it has in God's eyes. To see and evaluate things from God's perspective calls for constant conversion in the first days and years of our vocation, and, need I say, great humility. This is the part... That looks like it shouldn't be there to me, but it is. The cross shows us a different way of measuring success. Ours is to plant the seeds. God sees to the fruits of our labors. And if at times our efforts and works seem to fail and produce no fruit, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus. Slight pause. And his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure. The failure of the cross. And when I get to that,
I, I don't even know where he's coming from or where he's going with that. And he does not expand on what did he just say there. He does not expand upon it and say, let me clarify the meaning so there is no confusion amongst anyone there that I did not mean anything bad by that. And even after this article was printed, word for word, what, what he has said here, I've not heard any expansion upon this. And I cannot see how this is a positive statement at the end of this, this paragraph here. His, his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure. How is that? How is that that his life ended in failure? When he, the failure of the cross. What, what failure was there? He achieved victory over everything. Death. Satan. He opened up the gateway to forgiveness for all. Redemption and salvation. Mercy. How is that a failure of the cross? How did that end in failure when he conquered everything on the cross? I don't get it. And I've looked at that every way, upside down, backwards, forwards, sideways, and I just cannot see what in the world he was talking about, saying that was a failure. So, those are all things you should be aware of. You should have been watching. You should have been keeping your eyes open. You should have been thinking about. Hopefully you have been. If not, listen to me and what I shared with you today. It will make an impact on you. And you'll start opening your eyes and realizing things. Demons are not your friends. You watch too much movies, TV, play too many games. You're thinking that the greys and the reptilians and the Pleiadians, Mercurians, the Saturnians, the Syrians. You're thinking they're all just other life forms, a la Star Trek. Angels are all different classes, just like your cars are. Is a Cadillac the same kind of car as a Volkswagen? No. It's much bigger, more luxurious. It's a full size. A Volkswagen is very compact and smaller. But it's still a car. So just like some people think, there's different kinds of aliens. Alien just means not of this world, not from here, not from around here. Angels, there's all different kinds. 
and as the writings of Solomon have said. They can appear as they need to appear. They have their true form. They can appear as a man. They can appear as a dog, or a tree, or a gray, or a reptilian. Whatever they need to be to be the trickster, to fool you. They would not have put all this money in this machine if there weren't an idea big enough that they wanted to make it become a reality. Who supposedly gave mankind forbidden knowledge? Well, in the old old writings, Prometheus gave fire. He wasn't allowed to do that, but he did, didn't he? Well, he took something that was forbidden and he brought it down here and he gave it to man and supposedly helped him, didn't he? Same principle. These things gave man ideas and knowledges but showed them how to use it wrong. Do you get it? it? Showed them how to use it wrong. The fallen ones want man to do things their way, not God's way. The things that they showed, God would have taught man the right way. Of course, before we fell, we didn't even need any of it. But even so, if we would have rejected all these ways that they showed, possibly, maybe, God would have showed us the correct way to use these things for the good of all man. But instead, these guys showed how to use it in a controlling way. Make these swords, go over there, kill all them guys and take all their stuff, and then you'll have more and you'll have their kingdoms and you'll be powerful. We'll show you how to do this. All you got to do is worship us. Make us your, your lords. Bring us this many people every year and bleed them out and kill them and sacrifice to us and we'll keep you on top. And they just keep doing that to one kingdom after another kingdom after another kingdom. Each guy that made a deal ends up getting screwed over in the end. His kingdom never lasts. Because there's always a kingdom wanting to take over another kingdom. There's another guy wanting to be a king, more powerful than the other king. And he makes a deal, and he gets the power. Then he overcomes the prior kingdom that had a deal, and the demons screw him over and cause him to lose his kingdom. He gets killed. His soul goes to hell. That's how they do business. They lie. They never tell the truth. Nothing is for mankind's good. And this, well, that's going to be this week, apparently. So, we'll see what happens. That's a lot of power, folks. A lot of it. It's more than they've ever had. from everything I've looked at, if they are successful this week, we're going to have to keep ourselves open, observant, watchful, and on guard, because you're talking about something outside of the realm of our existence that they want to bring through. It doesn't matter if you believe it. 
you can say, Mr. Rod, you are full of crap. You have that luxury to think that, say that. It doesn't matter what we think ultimately. What matters is what these people think. Because what they think, they act upon. They think Lucifer is God. They worship him. And because of that, they act upon that allegiance to do all the things that they do. To do this thing. And to do this thing. To set the table for the Antichrist system. The system is in place and they're going to bring his buddies over as many as they can. Is your soul up for grabs? Do you know where you would go? If this was your last minute on earth, can you honestly say in your heart, I know 100% that when I die, I am going to go to the kingdom of heaven. If you cannot say that, if you are not 100% sure, you're in jeopardy. Because you have to be 100% sure. All you have to do is be saved. Allow the blood shed by Jesus to save you. Talk to him, just like I'm talking to you. It doesn't have to be any kind of special talk. It doesn't have to be anybody around. You can do it in the privacy of your own place. He's not only your Lord, your Savior, Messiah. He's your friend. He's the best friend you'll ever have. And he's always listening. He never casts a deaf ear to anyone. If you talk to him, he will listen. If you tell him that you love him, he's going to hear it. If you tell him you want to go into the kingdom of heaven, he's going to hear it. If you tell him you're sorry for being a scumbag your whole life and doing all the things that you know you shouldn't have done that were wrong, that were considered sin, and you're sorry for him, he's going to hear it. If you ask him to forgive you for all the crap that you've done, he's going to hear it. And when you're forgiven, it's forgotten. It's gone. It's erased from the book. The book of kept on each person of their sinful wrongdoings. And that's what you want. When that book gets open, you want the pages to be blank. You want your robe white and you want oil in your lamps. You ask him to save you and do the things that I've mentioned and say the things that I've said and mentioned. He will. He'll save you. And from that point on, it's up to you. You have to turn away from all the things that you just prayed for to be forgiven for and admitted to him that you did. You're not going to be able to remember them all. You just pray for everything. He knows what they all are. But he expects something in return. He expects you to walk with him. To turn away from it. Demons are going to come after you. Day in and day out. 
They're going to try to. They're going to try even harder to take you back, because they know that you've been saved, and they know that you're getting farther away from their sinful temptation. They don't expect things to get a whole lot easier right off the bat, but they will get easier. The closer you get to God, the farther away you get from them, even though they're going to be pushing harder and harder and harder to draw you back. You'll see what I mean. Put on the full armor of God to battle these evil demons. Right now, it's in the spirit. You can't see them. This is going to bring them over where you will see them. We're going into the next year shortly from now. <clears throat> I've said it before. I think I think Hillbilly Clinton is who they have chosen to place in office to follow up this Pharaoh in chief that we have had, this illegitimate one. And I believe, of course, that she's definitely a liar, a cheater, a scumbag. She's a perfect Luciferian New World Order placement, following in the footsteps of those who preceded her. I do not believe Donald Trump will win. I believe he is there for our enjoyment. He's just a breath of fresh air. Somehow, in a close race, of course, she's going to pull it out by the skin of her teeth. And I don't think he will, but it wouldn't surprise me if Trump didn't win the primary and, and Jeb Bush beat him. Because there's no, there's not a, a there's not a, a chance that Marco Rubio is going to finish ahead of Bush. It, it's, it's not a chance. Okay, the money talks. The bullshit walks. Rubio don't have crap compared to what the Bush family has. The two big boys on the Republican side are Trump and Bush. And a little play is going to carry out to where it's finally probably going to be them two duking it out. But I still say she gets in, unfortunately. Got a long way to go before the actual rigged numbers are placed out that say that you voted her in. That's the way it goes. They just broadcast, we did it. This is how we did it. But it's not us. It's them. They've already decided. We'll pray for the world, folks. It definitely, all peoples everywhere needs our prayers. we got to get as many people all over the world saved in the blood of Christ as we can. If we don't, they're all in jeopardy. That's a lot of souls to be going to hell. We all do your homework. Don't take my word. Do your own 
work and verify. Think about things. And talk to God every day. Keep your eyes on Israel. I said it before. Israel is the number one most important location on the planet. And how goes Israel? So goes the world. You hurt Israel. God will hurt you back on her behalf. Unless they have turned away from him. Whosoever curses Israel, going to get cursed. Who blesses Israel, they're going to be blessed. So I'll leave you with those words. May God's love and protection be upon all of you in the times that we come upon in our future. Until next time. <laughs>